All right, if you got your Bible, I'm going to start a new series this morning. If you got your Bible, open it up to Romans chapter 12. <laughs> Today, I know it's Super Bowl Sunday. It's a big game day, and everybody, whether you are or you're not excited about it, I think that that's kind of tapered off over the years a little bit. Maybe it's because your team ain't in it, and so that's all right. Mine's not in it, but... Hey, I'm going to go have some good fellowship today, right? But uh, today, this is what I want to do. Over the next couple of weeks, I actually want to go through and uh, I want to work through a series that I've entitled Relationships God's Way. Uh, oftentimes in life and in, in, in how we engage in culture, uh, it's easy for us to get isolated. In fact, this culture that we live in uh, today uh, really pushes us to complete isolation, even to the point to where many of us, because of what we experienced in 2020, all of a sudden we're working from home, we have less and less engagement in community, and so then all of a sudden we're seeing the byproduct of this is that now we're having relational problems where how people are engaging with one another, and in fact, I believe this, I believe that the Word of God speaks to every situation within life. I believe not only does it give us the gospel the truth that Jesus came to set the captives free, to seek and save those who are lost. But in that, it gives us the map, the road map for life. How do we live this life? And why should our life look different? And it tells us that we are new, cre new creatures, that we're born again. Well, what changes and how do we live out this life once we're born again? And so today and over the next couple weeks, I want to give you, I want to deal with some issues of, of, of conflict, commitment, I want to talk about influence. I want to look at a couple things in our life in relationship and even specifically the marriage, the life, the, the relationship of marriage of a, between one man, one woman for life. Come on, somebody. And I, I, I want to encourage you in this. Listen, look at your spouse right now, all the married men and, men and women, look at each other and tell, say, you have room to grow. I have room to grow. All God's children have room to grow. Amen. Amen? And this is my goal, is that over the next couple of weeks, to help us to mature. Help us to grow in our faith in Jesus, but then also in how we engage in our relationships to where they would be not our way, but God's way. I, I believe God's way is the way. I believe it's the best way. Amen? And so will you dive with me in scripture? Let's look at it. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I'll be reading it. It'll be on the screen now. The Message Bible just this morning. It says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Everybody say, thank you, Jesus. God's going to help you. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping. You're eating. You're going to work. And you're walking around life. And place it before God as an offering. What a concept. Here off the bat, Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and the Holy Spirit is inspired to him to speak these words of truth, of saying, listen, I want you to take your ordinary life, the way that you live life, and I want you to change it up a little bit. Everything from how you, how you live daily, how you, how you work, how you sleep, the things that you do during the day, how you engage with others, all this has taken place, and I want you to give it to God. I want you to place it before him as an offering. Look what he says, embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. What should I do for God? You should give your life as a living sacrifice. What, should I, what am I called to do? Live your life humbly before Almighty God. Surrendered to him completely. Because listen, your way is the wrong way. Your rights got you in a lot of wrong. Oh, but when you surrender to Him, you can be made right before all God Almighty. You become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And so here's the reality. Paul's saying, listen, man, place your life before God as an offering. Embracing what God's done for you, the sacrifice that He paid for you, is the best model, the best way for you to live your life is that you do the same, that you surrender, that you live likewise. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you lift or that you fit into it without even thinking. Come on, somebody. Don't be so consumed in your culture. Don't get lackadaisical. Don't get, don't get complacent in culture that all of a sudden you just begin to be settled and, and fit into it without even thinking. Instead, 
fix your attention on God. So how many of you, just real quick, how many of you YouTubed this week? I, now, come on. Y'all remember, y'all are in the church house. We don't want to have to change the message this morning. Remember, lying is in the Ten Commandments. The Big Ten, come on. How many of y'all got online and YouTube something this week? Got online, watched a video, or man, if you turned on your TV, chances are you watch TV through YouTube, right? How many of you Instagrammed something this week? How many of you got on Facebook this week to see what somebody else was doing? Listen, y'all are crazy. Y'all love watching other people's lives. More concerned about other people than yourself, right? That's, that's our culture. Here's the thing. Won't you catch this? He said, listen, this place where easily we get so consumed in culture, but here's the problem. Reason why, why God through, through Paul is, is bringing and highlighting this is because here's the problem. When we get consumed in culture, culture begins to dictate the patterns in our life. Do you know here at Harvest Time that we have a culture? There's a specific culture. If you go to any other church in our community, they have a culture. Culture is key, but culture dictates models or dictates uh, methods. It dictates actions. It dictates what you do and you don't do. Even in your own family, you have a culture. Some of you in your family, you have kids, and your culture is they can jump on the furniture, they can eat food wherever they want to. Listen, if you come to my house, that's not our culture. Come on, somebody. I'll never forget my mom used to always brag on me and my older sister, not Nancy. <laughs> So when me and my older sister, my parents were evangelists, and we traveled all over. In fact, uh, Sundays, we would be at a different church all the time, and, uh, or we'd be there for about a week because Dad would preach revivals. And, uh, but when we'd go to people's houses, my mom would always tell us, say, you know, whenever we go to people's houses, people would all of a sudden, the first day, would see you two young kids, and they'd begin to try to hide all the glass stuff, the breakables, they'd begin to try to move. And she'd say, you don't need to do that. You don't need canes don't mess with other people's stuff. My kids will stay right where I tell them to stay. They won't talk until I speak to them. And you know what? We sat because we knew better. Because my dad believed thoroughly in putting that leather to the tether end. Come on, somebody. I'll never forget my father-in-law one time told me whenever my kids, as they were younger, we have culture in our home, but culture just a little bit different and, and, and Papa and Nana's home. In fact, all of a sudden, Nano's lot had this little phrase of, well, my, my, this is my home, and my grandbabies can do such and such in my home. My father-in-law pulled me aside and said, Nathan, do you want to fix that problem? I said, I would love to know how. He goes, just pull your child aside and remember, tell them, remember, but you're going back to my home. And just inform them that they will be disciplined even though they act this way in that home when they get back to their home. That helped. That helped greatly. Amen? So that's a freebie for you. I hope that some young people, listen, if you were single, that was one of those you should have wrote down. That was, that's good information. It goes a long ways. All the grandparents are like, don't be saying that. Right? It's a culture. It, it dictates how we respond in life. And here's the problem. God knows this. And so he wants us to be cautious of what we give ourselves to. So fix your attention on God. Listen to what he says. You'll be changed from the inside out. Come on, somebody. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Man, notice what God desires for our life. Don't sit on it. No. Respond. But the Bible says, brother, to be quick to hear and slow to speak. Come on, listen to me. But when it's sin, run! Come on. When the Bible speaks about Jezebel, it said, throw her down. Get rid of her. James said, flee from the devil. Come on. And so whenever it's something that's not godly, get away from it. Man, and whenever you see the truths of the word of God that can radically change your life, quickly receive. Quickly respond. 
to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you. Listen, if you don't highlight anything else, if you don't write anything else down, you need to write that truth down. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Come on, somebody. That's a good place to say amen. And so here's the reality. God's way is the best way. God's way. In fact, here Paul's saying, listen, don't continue in your ordinary way of life, but begin to change and, and live in a way that is completely different than what you see in this world that's been modeled before us. When I was a young youth pastor, and I, even still to this day, I had this model. I had this statement. I tell my kids this. If they're not a potential mate, don't date. If, there's no, if, they're, if they're not going to go to church, if they don't love Jesus, if they don't tithe, come on, somebody. I don't want my kids living with anybody who have bad habits. I want my kids to, to look for people who model before them Christ's likeness. I don't care how mature they are. I want them to look for mature believers. You know why? Because listen, and real quick, I, I'll just tell you, it clears the playing field pretty quick nowadays. My, my, my. I've got a daughter who's fixed to take off and go to college, and I'm praying, dear Lord, help us. <laughs> and so I, I have this, listen, there's some standards within life because, listen, our culture models a culture of give up, to quit, to once the moment that we don't like something, we have the right to get what we want. And so we'll leave and we'll go cleave to somebody else because we're trying to satisfy and our perspective of relationships is what does it have for me? It's all about me, myself, and I. If I'm not happy, I have the right for happiness. So I can make you miserable and even make you want to leave me. Or if you don't, I'll give up on you and I'll find happiness elsewhere. That's not God's way. That's not God's pattern. In fact, there is and can be complete joy in marriage. There can be complete joy in relationships in spite of one another. But over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk through some of these truths and let me just, I'm going to help get you on the right track. Because oftentimes, whenever our focus is me, myself, and I, that alone tells us we're on the wrong track. We're on the wrong path. So today, let's start it off. And I want to talk about love this morning. Because this helps to give us a perspective of relationship to get our minds, our focus in the right place. To begin to see what it looks like. In fact, we see this great model of love found in John 3.16. Some call this the, the 316 principle. I want you to look at this. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What incredible truth. What incredible promise. Man, you've heard, if you've been in church for any given amount of time, you've probably heard this passage. You probably have responded to this passage. So you might have even prayed and said, thank you, Lord, for loving me and for giving me eternal life. But how does this correlate within relationships? Well, reality is this. Our most important relationship is not with our spouse. Our most important relationship is not with our kids. Our most important relationship is not with our, our coworkers. It's not even with our church family. Our first and most important relationship is with God Almighty. Our first relationship is always first vertical. The place where we look to He who is our Creator. The one who created it all, the one who sustains it all, the one who keeps us all. Amen? And the place to surrender to him, we begin to see that this love that he speaks about and the truths of what we gain, these principles in our life. Let me show them to you. The first one is this, is that God's love is unconditional. When we recognize the great love of God, we recognize that it's not based upon our merits. It's not based upon how good we look. It's not based upon how well we are or how good we are. It's not based upon our achievements. In fact, do you realize that when we come before God Almighty with our resume of life, every one of our resumes look exactly the same? It says, sinner, enemy of God, lost, condemned to hell. You know what God sees? 
you're mine. I love you. I want you. His love is unconditional. It's not based upon your merits. It's not even based or upheld based upon how much you return that love. Romans 5, 8 says that while we were yet, so God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you realize that God showed how much he loves you when you were furthest away from him? Not whenever you was tickling his ears saying, I love you. Man, you're, you're a good looking God. You're so wonderful. Look at all you created. Look at all your great accomplishments, God. I serve you. I'm wholeheartedly, completely in love with you. No, it's whenever we despised him. It's whenever we would spit upon him. When we would curse his name. Whenever we would reject his bride, the church, and have nothing to do with them and mock them because of their delusion and serving an unseen God. He loved you unconditionally. God's love is unconditional. But not only that, listen, God's love is sacrificial. He paid the greatest price to demonstrate his extravagant love for you. Scripture says, listen, for God so loved you that he gave his only son. See, it's one thing for somebody to sacrifice their life for you. It's another for them to sacrifice their greatest love for you. He gave the one thing that no one could ever give. Perfect, spotless lamb that would once and for all settle all the sin debts of all mankind. It was sacrificial. Jesus demonstrated his love for the Father and responds the same love for her towards us that be manifest through his act. As he sat in the garden of Gethsemane and he called out to the Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. But if it's your will, I'll surrender. And that same response is what we're called to as we partake of this love. It's unconditional. It's sacrificial. God's love is personable. Listen, I want you in your Bible, the best thing you could ever do is love, I love this, to go through and write there where it says world, just write your name right up above it. That place of recognizing that if it was only you, Jesus would have paid the price for you. Not just whenever we see the world, we think, oh man, all these people, they're all lost. But no, listen, the focus is this. When he says the world, it's because it's incumbent of everyone who's lost. God's a personal God that whenever he calls out names, Scripture says he knows you by name. In fact, he knows everything about you. He says that in your mother's womb, he formed and fashioned you for purpose. In fact, he created a purpose he had a plan in place and a purpose. And he said, I need somebody to help take. I'm going to form and fashion. And all of a sudden, he began to form and fashion you in your mother's womb. With plan and purpose. Life was breathed into you. You were born into this world with a plan and purpose. And listen, nobody can fulfill that plan and purpose greater than you can. So what happened if I don't do it? Yeah. It'll just be like with Moses and Aaron. Think about with Moses. Whenever Jesus, when God told him, he said, I, I want you, you're going to be my mouthpiece. I've got, I've got a stammer. I, I've got a stuttering problem. I, I, they're, they're not going to listen to me, God. Why don't you use Aaron instead? And as he followed God over this, all of a sudden God says, all right. What would have happened if Moses would have been in the very beginning, the mouthpiece of God? We'll never know until we get to heaven. But I want to tell you something. Nobody could have spoke and communicated better than what Moses would have done. Because that was God's plan. Amen. But if you forsake God's plan, God's plan will always be fulfilled. But only you could do it to the degree that God created you and formed and fashioned you to fulfill it. Amen. Come on, somebody. There's people who are lost in this world. I believe this with all my heart. That you're the one who is God's going, who's going to be God's mouthpiece to speak into their life.
for salvation. I believe that there's people today that they're still lost because you haven't spoken up. That weighs heavy. I want you to hear that. But see, whenever you experience this love of God, it should compel you to want to love like that. It should compel you to say, God, hey, don't let me miss out on what you call me to do because you're close to us. God's not a God who's afar, but he's close, he's present, he's personable. He loves you. God's love is acceptable. It's like I told you, in our worst state, in our greatest sin, he paid the greatest sacrifice for you to redeem you, to reconcile you. Not only that, God's love is accessible. Friend, even right in this very moment, before an altar call is even given, if you're far from God, you right now could call out to him because he's close to you. He's right there with you. And here's the beauty, is that he comes and dwells the believer by his spirit. He's with you everywhere you go, every single day of your life. My, my, my. And so I just want to encourage you. God loves you today. Doesn't matter what anybody has said to you. In this culture, people are mean. They're hateful. They hurt with their words. Oh, but God, in his great love and mercy, doesn't matter what you've done. He's not a God waiting to bash you and tell you how wicked you are and tell you he hates you and despise. No. He's like the good father who's standing on the front porch porch waiting for you to return home. He's got tears in his eyes. His heart is beating your name, saying, I love my children. And in spite of what we've done, he has the best waiting for us. When we deserve death, he has life abundant. Come on, somebody. You know why? Because he loves you. Not like the love that this world gives, but God kind of love. So how does this relate to us? John, 1 John 4, it says this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. That's John 3, 16. It says this is love. What is love? Right here. This is love. Not that we loved God, but listen, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And so we know and rely, and rely on the love God has for us. We love because he first loved us. I want you to write this truth down today. Here's the secret to love. The secret love is this. Being loved by God. See, I believe this is that for a person truly to understand love and to truly love, they first have to have the revelation of the love of God. They first have to receive his love. You want to settle racism? Racism is, is a byproduct of hate. You want to settle that issue in our culture? Then you know what? Get people saved. Because only God can transform the heart of man. Come on, young, young ladies in this house, all look at me. If you're single this morning, I want to help you out with a relational truth. You cannot and will not change him. It won't happen. If you're a believer, just because, oh, but he loves me and he'll love everything without me and it'll be just wonderful and we'll Instagram together, it's going to be wonderful. Let me just help you out. He'll say everything. He'll tickle your ears. He'll say everything you want to hear just to satisfy himself. He'll do everything he can, everything he can to gain from you only what you can give to satisfy for a moment pleasure in his life, not to satisfy you. Come on, listen to me. Young men in this house who are single, listen to me. She'll tell you that you're her man. She'll tell you that you're amazing. She'll brag on you. She'll hold your arm. She'll woo you. 
And she will do things for you that maybe others won't in that moment, you think. Just to try to beef you up. But ultimately, it's all for self-gain. To satisfy herself. I want to tell you something. People lie to people. People. But Pastor, you don't know. He loves me. I'm going to tell you what the old timers used to tell me. It's not love. It's called lust. If they love you, listen, you want to find out if they love you? Say, listen, my standards are this. You're not allowed to hold my hand. You're not allowed to kiss me. You're not allowed to hug me. If you really love me, let's see if you can prove this out. For a single year, if my daddy says it's all right for you to date me, you can pay for dates. You'll pay for my food. When we go out, you'll open my door for me. You'll close it behind me. But not only that, You'll make sure to speak to my daddy, have a good relationship with my daddy. You'll honor my mom as well as you do the same thing for your mom and your daddy. After a year, then we'll consider holding hands and showing some affection. What a concept. Do y'all realize the first step to sex? You know what it is? Touch. And then all of a sudden... We, we, we want to go from holding hands and oh, he touched my hand. Some of you guys, y'all remember back in the days of movie theaters and just to hope to hold a hand kind of thing. The next thing it slips to all of a sudden deeper affection. Maybe it's a kiss. My model is this. Don't you dare do anything with my daughter that you're not willing to do with me. Why? Because, listen to me, our place of response, our greatest level of intimacy, listen, it's not physical touch. It's that which touches the soul. And the thing you're protecting is your emotions and your mind. Because we want our soul surrendered to the spirit, not the flesh. Why is it important as singles, listen to me, why is it so important that you preserve your virginity till marriage? Because the moment that you begin to go to that point and you dabble in that, you're surrendering your mind, your will, and your emotions to the flesh. Listen, that's a false love. In flesh, our love should be a byproduct of sacrifice, of surrender of humility, of commitment. All you parents should be like, come on, preacher, my, 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 come on. You should be dancing around this building now, right now like the old Pentecostals running around saying, that's good preaching. You know why? You know why you're struggling with it right now? Because you don't even believe that. In this culture, we've given to the ways of this world and our perspective of love is man's kind of love. Well, what's wrong with them kissing? That's innocent preacher. What's wrong with them holding? They need to experiment a little bit to get to know one another. Why? Who gave you that lie? Come on, somebody. Do you know that even in my home, my kids aren't even allowed to have their cell phones in their bedroom. You know why? Because no young man or one woman is going to be going in their bedroom. I want to guard the relationship. I want to protect that. And I want them to have a godly perspective of what true relationships look like. And so how does this happen? Our perspective, our first focus is this. God loves us. And so the way that God loves us is the way that we model that love. Amen? Look here, I want you to show you. I got to hurry up. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. This is the love passage. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil. Come on, somebody. But it rejoices in the truth. Love, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Second truth, second secret to love. Number one is this, we've got to understand how God loves us. The second is this, 
The second secret of love is showing God's love to others. And so quickly, I want to give you these simple, practical ways of how you show your love to others. Simple truths of how you model this in your day-to-day living. The first one is this, if you're taking notes, showing God's love. Listen, gentlemen, you need to write this down. This will help you out. I, I'm, I, I, I'm, these are areas that even I need to practice in. Every day of our life, we need to work on these areas, but these are practical. And good, listen, in two days, it's a good day to practice. Today, you can start. You can plan. Walmart's just right down the road. Come on. Crumble cookie, just right down the road. Nothing but cake, just over here in McKinney. I'm going to help you out a little bit, all right? And all the ladies in the house said? You're welcome. All the ladies in the house. Guess what? Valentine's Day goes two ways. You got to do it too. Here we go. I want to help you out. First was this is say it. Say it. Do you realize the scripture declares the love of God to us? The same way in your marriage, same way in your relationship with those around you, that place of, of saying, now listen, guys, I don't go around and just, I love you, gentlemen. We want to bro it up a little bit. Come on. It's all right. Hey, I love you. It's all right. I'm not saying, but listen, with your wife, every day you need to say to her, I love you. Look at her in the eyes. I love you. On a regular basis, I ask Miss Casey, Casey, do you love me? You know why? Because I want to hear it on a regular basis. And you know what she does on a regular basis? She tells me, Nathan, I love you. And especially if I ask her this, she makes sure to do a little bit more than normal. Right? You need to say it. Declare it. Not only that, write it. Write it down. I'll tell you something I cherish. I don't even know if Casey knows this or not. But if you go in my office, in, my, in my, my desk drawer, there are these little letters. I, th- I believe there's five of them. Uh, they're on little cards. And Casey wrote these to me right after we got engaged. And she gave them to me. And I went on a, on a, a cruise <laughs> right after our engagement. And anyway, every day she wrote these little cards on it and just said, I love you. And, uh, and in it, it has that. And I every now and then pull them out and I just read them. It, it just reminds me of how... <laughs> That was my daughter, by the way. So anyway, but it just, it just reminds me that it just, and it kind of gives me that, it's kind of like that whole place where I pray all the time, Lord, remind me of the first day that whenever I surrendered my life to you, when you saved me. Well, listen, I, I want to remind of that point, that first time whenever, man, whenever we committed to ourselves for life, to each other for life, not ourselves, but to each other for life. And that place of just reminding, listen, it don't have to be long. And listen, I'm the world's worst at writing cards. You know why? Because I think I have to write paragraphs. Ask my staff. They're always like, listen, just say, just go straight to the point. You, gotta get, you don't have to give all the other stuff. I like details, so I give a lot of details. I'm sorry. So let me just say this. I love you, church. <laughs> say it, right? Say it. Write it down. Third one is this. Give it. Give it. Scripture shows that God said that his love was sacrificial. It shows that it was sacrificial. He sacrificed. And here's the reality is the same thing in the life that we can demonstrate our love for one another. That we can give that love. Sometimes we do it with, with simply just acts of kindness. In fact, if you've never read Gary Chapman's uh, five, The Five Love Languages, I would encourage you to read that book. Right now, go on Amazon, download it, read it. It's a great read because this is what you're going to find out is what the, your love languages, the five dominant love languages of man. And what happens is, as you look at that, most of us have at least two of those. And so to learn what your spouse's love language is will help you go a long ways. In fact, gentlemen, let me just help you out this morning. Chances are, with your wife, probably acts of kindness. It might just happen to be one of her love languages. And let me just give you one kind of practice. That would be this. This week, whenever the dirt dishes pile up in the kitchen... Don't wait on her to say anything. Don't say nothing. Go in there and clean all the dishes. Don't say nothing. Don't point it out. Don't say, look what I did, because you just run it. But just go in there and clean them all up, put them in the dishwasher, and then not just that, unload the dishwasher, put them away. I've got kids, and so they help me on that part. Praise you, Jesus. But out of that, put them away. And not only that, maybe even while you're at it, vacuum the floors without her saying, without her even knowing about it. That's acts of kindness. Come on, somebody. And so just see what happens. 
I may just get a lot of thank you emails this week. Just possibly. Give it. Show love. Show love. The fourth thing is as the worship team comes back up, forgive it. Forgive it. Listen, I want to tell you something. We're mankind. We're flawed. We mess up. Those of you who are in this room and who are married, you've, you've had to come at some point. You've had maybe not a fight, maybe just a little disagreement. But at some point, because we're man, we clash. And on those points, it's easy for us to take deep offense and all of a sudden we begin to harbor offense. And the problem is, is then all of a sudden, it affects the way that we love one another. Oftentimes, love grows cold and distant because of hurts. And some of us, even because of past hurts and things that we begin to see model and current hurts cause walls to begin to go up and ultimately can lead to separation. And I want to tell you something. The most beautiful thing that God did in demonstrate his love towards us was that he forgave us. He forgave us of all of our sins. All the things. Listen, when you trespass, when you sin, you're not sinning against one another. You sin against God. See, that's the problem. Whenever, whenever you commit adultery, listen, you just didn't do that to that spouse, to your spouse. You committed an act against God. That's the reason why we're fallen. That's the reason why we're lost. That's the reason why our payment is death. Oh, but God, through his great love and mercy towards us, in Jesus not only to pay the price for that sin because we never could settle it there's not enough letters there's not enough acts of kindness in him and his great love he settled the payment of sin once and for all he forgave and friend listen the same calling is for us we model the same mercy that was shown to us that we showed that to one another. The same grace that was shown to us we showed to one another. We forgive it. We write it. We say it. We give it. We forgive it. And simply lastly, we live it. Let me say this. Spouses, married couples, everyone should know who your spouse is. Everyone should know who's important to you. Everyone should see how much you love your spouse. You know what? We all fail at times. We get selfish. We get complacent. We stop dating. We stop talking. We stop having those special moments. The reality is this. It's noticeable. And it's not even what your spouse is who I'm talking about. It's with the lover of your soul. And this is the truth I know. If this relationship is cold and distant, it'll affect every every relationship horizontally. If you become quiet from God, if you're not praying, and not spend time in His presence, I want to tell you something that's going to make it that much harder for you to do the same with people around you that you love and cherish. He's our first love. Our response is where we tell Him how much we love Him. We write it down. Journal, Lord. You're so good to me. You're so faithful. We show it as we receive his love we give it in return we serve we begin to walk out like how he lived we forgive others as he forgave us and daily we live this truth life Romans tells us in verse 15 it says rejoice with those who rejoice share others joy 
and weep with those who weep, share others' grief. Man, that we have our love for one another, but also because of our love for the Father, we show compassion. We surrender our life completely to help to build one another up, to love one another, to rejoice with them, to weep with them. Because ultimately, here's the reality. When all else has fallen, listen, the three things that stand, the three things that remain, Scripture says, is faith, hope, and love. And so friends, I want to tell you, I don't care, I don't know where your relationships are, but I think today is a great day just to renew that relationship, first and foremost, with the lover of your soul, your first love, King Jesus. Man, what a great day to say, Lord, maybe I'm failing in a marriage, maybe I'm failing in kids, or maybe maybe you feel like that, or maybe you've known that it's gone cold or distant. But man, why not before you ever engage there, start with the one that's going to help you? I said, Lord, I want to draw close to you. I want to share truth with you. Sadly in almost every divorce situation that I've had to help walk with couples through, when there's been to the point where there's separation, almost inevitably there's one of the spouses who just goes hardcore in their faith. Almost inevitably, every single time, if they're believers, typically one runs from their faith and one digs deep into faith. Here's the crazy thing. Most of the time, the one who digs deep is the one who is furthest from God. They cling to the hope. Listen, this is why I'm challenging you today. Don't be that model. No matter where you, whether you're single, where you're married, listen, both of you together make the decision. We're going to go hardcore into Jesus. Man, we're going to surrender everything, our marriage, our lives. God is going to be first in our relationship. Pray together. Maybe today, it might be the two of you coming to the altar. Maybe today, it's both of you sooner and saying, Lord, we recommit our lives to give it to you. So right there where you're at, every head bowed and every eye closed. What a truth. That God loved you so much. And before you could ever begin to love mankind God's way first he needs to be first in your life if you're here today and you're far from God and you say pastor I'm going to get right with God that I can model not only receive his love knowing he loves me but I want to be able to live this out towards my family towards my friends so today maybe you're here and you were saying I want to choose to follow Jesus Maybe just right there where you're in your pew, you may say a prayer like this. Say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm far from you. But today, by your spirit, I sit you close to me. Today, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I acknowledge you and believe in my heart that you truly, Jesus, are the son of the living God. And I choose today to follow you from this day forward. To receive your love ultimately your love can be shown through my life I choose to follow you Jesus thank you for saving me thank you for being Lord of my life and by your spirit help me to live daily that you be glorified in through my life in Jesus mighty name